Hi, my name is Jay Sugarman, and I want to welcome you to Museum Open House. This ongoing series features and highlights many of the outstanding museums and other cultural institutions. The main purpose of most programs is to inform viewers about current and upcoming exhibits, various programs, resources, and other opportunities that are available for the general public. Today via Zoom, we're fortunate to have as our guest, Keelan Caldwell. Keelan serves as the Interim Deputy Director of the MIT Museum, as well as its Director of Engagement, and she's also the Director of the Cambridge Science Festival. In addition to informing us about the history and mission of the MIT Museum, Keelan is here today to take us on a behind-the-scenes tour and in the process will come to better understand and appreciate the wide range of fascinating galleries, exhibitions, programs, events, and other opportunities that are available at the MIT Museum. Let's start by meeting Keelan and then hearing all about the MIT Museum. Welcome Keelan, so delighted to be able to be here. Hi Jay, thanks so much for having me. You know, last week I had the opportunity, wonderful opportunity to visit the museum. And my only regret is that it took me two years to make it to the current, not new anymore, location. Um, wow, that incredible reset, both in location and I think even vision and what's available. Eager to hear more about it from you and have you inform viewers. But before we jump right to that, I think it would be of interest if you'd share just a little bit more about your background, what attracted you to the museum, and what your various positions entail. Sure, can do. Um, yeah, my background, I mean, I think many people end up in museums for different reasons, right? So uh, I actually went to school for horticulture, for plant science. <gasps> I was in the lab, I was doing science, and uh, I missed people. <laughs> so I started working at the Botanic Garden that was on my college campus um, and went on to work at additional botanical gardens, at parks, um, at museums. So I have a, I have a um, graduate degree in public horticulture administration, which is really just uh, sort of nonprofit management in the cultural sector. Mm -hmm. um, before the, I came here, I had been working at the Rose Kennedy Greenway Conservancy downtown in wow. Boston for about 10 years. Um, loved it there, but I was looking um, just for a different experience. And uh, similar to you, I had not been to the MIT Museum in its new location. Uh, and when I came and checked it out, I was blown away. Um, it's such a sort of pivotal moment for the, in the history of the MIT Museum this new building that opened two years ago. We have a new director that started in July. So, um, it was just an exciting time to join a team that was sort of in the midst of change and expansion. Mm -hmm. well, can you share a little bit about the history and mission and how that's developed over the years, please? Sure. Yeah. So the MIT Museum was founded in the 70s. Um, and, you know, at the time, uh, MIT was accumulating a lot of things, right? Uh, there was a lot of closets filled with filled with stuff. Uh <laughs> And so the founding director was uh, really had the vision to like, let's let's get that organized um, and keep it and make it seem um, like a collection that has purpose and mission. So the mission today is really about making um, research and innovation accessible to everybody. Uh, and that uh, can really be seen, I think, in the new location. Right. So the way the exhibits are set up, there is introductions to sort of MIT, but it's more about the ethos of what, um, yeah. how to make uh, scientific discoveries, which is very creative. You know, I think there's a tendency for people to be like, either I'm a science person or I'm an art person. And I think this museum is about bridging that gap, right? In order to be a good scientist or innovator or researcher, um, it's actually really important to have a strong creative vision and uh, side of yourself. Well, I know we're going to hear more as we take our tour, but what really struck me is how inviting the museum is to the community, to visitors in general, really want to interact uh, beyond just the exhibitions, uh, galleries, but really valuing the human connection uh, really struck me as never seen before in a museum, that type of upfront from the very first uh, step you take into the museum. I'm so happy to hear you say that because that was a big um, 
push in the design of this space. I mean, we're right uh, at the Kendall T station. Uh, so extremely just actually accessible, right? In terms of uh, being able to take the train and be steps away from the entrance to the museum. You were also in the sort of new Kendall Square gateway area that you can see here in the picture. So you're looking out um, at the MIT open space and then that taller building in the background, uh, we're on the, the first few floors of that of that space. And, you know, one thing I think uh, is important to point out is that the lobby space was really created as, as a, as a third place, like an open space for anybody. You don't have to pay admission to look at the lobby exhibition. Um, and that changes every six months or so. There's a cafe that's connected to it. There's a, a great museum store. So I think uh, we really, we're going for that, like welcoming feeling that, uh, and people all the time stumble upon the museum, you know, get out of the tea stop and say, what is this? <laughs> Come in and, and then stay. Um, no, terrific, terrific. You know, before we hear more and look at some wonderful images about a few of the galleries and areas, for those who haven't had a chance to visit yet, could you just give us a overview of what's uh, available? Yeah, you know, I think... Um, the MIT Museum really exists to connect sort of curious minds with MIT's unique culture of problem solving, playful creativity. Um, so you don't have to be like an MIT super fan <laughs> in order to have a good experience here. It's it's almost like a grown up, you know, museum for anyone who's curious. Um, so yeah, when you come in, um, there's that whole lobby space and then we have two floors of exhibits. Um, those rotate around, you know, there's a few and we'll kind of go through them. There's a few that are, are meant to stay for a longer amount of time, even though individual parts of that exhibit might rotate. And then there's bigger topical areas that uh, we'll be switching out you know, in the next couple of years as we sort of, we opened everything new fresh two years ago, we've refreshed a lot of things and then we're, we're getting ready to relaunch certain spaces. And a terrific maker area, learning labs, there really is so much there. And I know uh, you're situated uh, in the area. Yeah, exactly. Um, there is a maker space right here in the museum that's open daily um, from 2.30 to 4.30, a little bit longer on the weekends. Um, we do have excellent educational facilities. We have a big auditorium area uh, with this humongous screen. You can sort of see a little bit of it in the background here um, where we do all kinds of programming, book talks and movies, but also really popular series called After Dark that happens once a month mm -hmm. where the whole museum is open. So if you just wanna check out the exhibits, they're all open, you can see those, but with the added benefit of um, a bunch of activities on a certain theme. So for example, we had um, an After Dark called Beyond the Fold where it was all sort of origami or folding related uh -huh. activities. Uh, so the themes are playful. It's not just straightforward. Um, we had some origami, we had some uh, dumpling folding from May May Dumpling. Fabulous, fabulous. So trying to, to bring that all together and and create a sense, like you're saying, of of community, not just I come and I walk around the museum, but I come and see different things every time and interact with different types of people. Terrific, terrific. And I think that sense of playfulness is, uh, is an important part of innovation, creativity, and a lot that goes on throughout the museum, but also the whole MIT uh, campus as well. Let's take advantage of these terrific images you made available and start in the area, Essential MIT, that, again, this is the area that first struck me as setting the tone of a big, big uh, goal and idea of the museum's reset. Yeah, exactly. So you enter when you come up the the staircase. This is what you're greeted with at the top of the stairs, and it is sort of a a place to set your expectations for the visit and learn a little little bit more about MIT. And and I mean that um, more in those those ethos, those values. So when you see these black pillars, they're almost like the pillars of MIT, right? And mm -hmm. they are things like um, being creative, working across disciplines to solve complex problems, um, imagining uh, solutions that you, that wouldn't have been possible in the past, right? So like in the back of this area is the machine that proved Einstein's theory of relativity, which, you know, wow 
had been written for many years, but not proven um, until an MIT professor um, had an idea and made made the machine. Uh, mm. So yeah, this is a great um, sort of first stop. Um, here you can see sort of from the other side, uh, actually it relates to what I just talked about beyond the fold. This is a um, the gold piece you're seeing is a star shade. Um, mm -hmm that use the principles of origami. So again, bringing in creativity or, or the interdisciplinary um, factors to think about how you could deploy, you know, a very large scale shade in space so that it would self-assemble and pop open and allow us to better look for exoplanets. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, it's always a nice place to stop first because you kind of get a sense of this ethos, which um, again is MIT, it's it's MIT specific, but I actually think it's relevant to everybody, right? In terms of like how you think about your own life and you know mm. you get into your own rhythm of uh, your job or the things you like, but that actually bringing in different parts of your personality or creativity can really uh, help you succeed in all your areas of life, right? I think that's kind of where it boils down to. You know, one of the galleries here, Gene Couch, is sort of epitomizes a lot of the work at MIT, but the whole Kendall Square life sciences area, sort of the capital of the world in that field in these days. Um, just a few words about this gallery, please. Yeah, I think this is a, a great example of how we like to fuse together the arts and the science. So there are pieces in here that are very scientific, right? Uh, a fifth of the machine that uh, did the first human genome mm -hmm. yeah, as a human genome project is in there. But so is this pink chicken, which is an art, an art piece reflecting on, you know, sort of our impact on genetics and the fossil record and it's a playful it's playing around with the idea of what if we made every chicken every part of every chicken pink would we actually change the fossil <laughs> record um so i think uh we love touring people through this exhibit because it really shows how science and art can be in conversation um so it's one of my favorite places in the museum for sure right now there's so much to take in um but this is a wonderful opportunity to get a nice overview. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and kind of dive deeper and ask even questions you weren't thinking about, right? There's parts of this exhibit that are really looking at, um, for example, peppermint that we use today um, was actually discovered in sort of like a radioactive zone, right? So it was a rapid um, genetic mutation that made it sort of what it is today. So there's a whole piece around like, hey, should we actually be like proactively farming <laughs> in, <laughs> in radioactive zones to see what happens, right? Because we can kind of get this this burst of creativity from nature. Um, so and that's that, another example of sort of the thoughtfulness you can experience there. And the next gallery you'd like to hear about one extremely timely today, uh, in the news about AI and work that's been done at MIT and beyond. Yeah, so um, now we've sort of gone up the stairs, we're on the third floor. Uh, and what I love about this gallery is you just said how timely it is, but actually this was installed in 2022, right before we were using mm. all using chat GPT. Um, and I love how they they were able to design in a way that was flexible to that future, right? So it's it's sort of built around big questions, right? Are what are um, computers good at, and what are humans good at? Where can we help each other? Um, and there's a lot of interactivity in this exhibit as well. You can um, talk to one of the little social robots that you see there, uh, which was designed, you know. Not like an Alexa where you're just asking for information, but actually as a companion for someone that might be, um, you know, in a uh, situation where they're alone or they, they they need some some companionship. So it's actually it's fun to ask the robot to kind of interact with you. We also have a this is a poetry writer. So you're writing with AI, which, again, when this exhibit opened, people really hadn't experienced the back and forth with chat GPT. Um, but this exhibit is still really popular because you still get this very visual experience, right? Mm. You write the poem and then it like flies up above you. Uh, yeah. So yeah, this um, this is definitely one of our most loved exhibits in terms of that interactivity. You, there's also a part where you can um, 
test yourself on sort of deep fakes. Um, and they're just those clips of people doing normal things. It's not any big like celebrity thing. Uh, and you get to guess if it's real or fake. And then it sort of explains to you um, if it's fake, what you're looking for, right? The area on the glasses usually doesn't look right. All those kinds of sort of tips, um, which is so timely, like you said. And th this next area, Cosmograph, brings together science, technology, art. A few words about what visitors can experience here, please. Yeah, so Cosmograph, this um, gallery is a collaboration with MIT's Center for Art, Science, and Technology, uh, which for people that don't know MIT well, uh, MIT is a really thriving arts scene. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a great collaboration. And, and then this uh, gallery is with a, a firm called Design Earth of Artists. And it's it's a really like speculative fictions. Like what would it be like if we were mining asteroids? If mm. we were, um, you know, custom designing <laughs> planets in space. Uh, so it's visually completely striking and then deeply thoughtful in terms of, yeah, sort of what, what might our visions in space exploration look like? You know, while there aren't many, uh, one of the areas from the old museum that made its way to the new museum of the holograms. Yes. Actually backed by popular demand. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is a, a, an area, uh, we actually have the biggest collection of holograms in the world um, mm. in our collection, which I should mention has, you know, one and a half million objects. So we do have quite wow. a, <laughs> and you're only seeing a little fraction of that display at any moment. Um, but this exhibit called Optiker uh, looks at Stephen Benton's holograms, who was really a pioneer in hologram technology. Uh, and holograms are fascinating. You know, they're they're complicated uh, how exactly they work. And, um, you know, today they're mostly used in things like, you know, you might see that little like hologram on your credit card, but the mm -hmm. way they store information is really fascinating. Uh, and the, the, the first image you showed where the head looks um, almost white uh, was that was like a real um, uh, achievement in the field of holography to get that rainbow look to re kind of fractalize into really almost white. Um, so really it's like groundbreaking holograms. So they're, they're cool no matter what, but actually mm. the ones we have on display here are especially uh, meaningful. Most definitely. And moving on, this is a fabulous area. MIT collects, uh, so many things to spend time looking at. A few words, please, about this area. Yeah, so this um, gallery really speaks to that 1.5 million <laughs> objects in the collection and a little bit more about uh, maybe why we collected them or some of the themes that have emerged out of there. So this is an area where the specific things on display do change a fair amount, but there's you know a big wall of mod just models from our collection, of which there are many. Um, yeah, you can kind of see it in the background there. There's a whole section which you're seeing in the foreground here around um, the Black experience at MIT and the history and objects we have in the collection that speak to that. Um, the history of computing, so some of the like earliest computers and, and down to like, um, you know, more information about the hacks that have happened at MIT, which is sort of a famous... Uh, uh, tricks that students like to play that are quite mechanically complicated, right? like putting a police car on the top of the dome of MIT in the middle of the night. Um, so there, I like this area really, I feel like has something for everyone in terms of interest areas. Um, and again, it's, it's MIT specific, but it's of general knowledge, right? Um, I hope you had that experience when you came that it's more about curiosity than anything else. Mm -hmm. And even when you're not at the museum, you can access the collection online. Um, just a quick note about that opportunity. Yeah, correct. Yeah, if you navigate to our website, um, there's a whole section about our collection. And, you know, we just undertook the humongous task of moving all of those objects. So as part of that, we were actually able to catalog um, a lot more than we had in the past. And we just really finished moving everything to a, uh, a collections management facility that's in Medford. So for the first time, everything's sort of in one place and uh, really stored a top-notch um, 
in a top notch way. So it's so like a very, again, an exciting sort of moment of change for us that everything is now much more accessible than it used to be. And this area here, the exchange sort of uh, provides a space to engage the community, to share ideas. A few words about what goes on in this wonderful area. Yeah, so this is sort of that auditorium space I was talking about. It's right in the middle of the museum, so between the second and third floor. Um, and we we use this for all kinds of things. You know, of course, we have more of like evening programs where we might have, um, you know, a, a recent author talking. Uh, usually we try to have conversations, right, in conversation with um, another professional in their field, Um we might have a film screening, um, mostly of sort of, we work with the Woods Hole Film Festival to curate that and, and think about topics that make sense for our audience. Um, and we also, uh, when this is not a program, we have a, a sort of amazing um, art exhibit itself on the screen mm. where a, it's an AI program that's pulling images for our collection and reconfiguring them. So there's like always something to see in that space. And I think, again, I guess to this idea of like, you know, to the extent possible, we want people to feel like they can hang out here right? and and not just um, sort of come and walk around. And we we find that in visitor services, that uh, visitor um, surveys, that people are conversing, they are, you know, interacting with the people that they're there with. It's not just sort of this like move through the museum and not along at the galleries, right? That there are these chances for deeper conversation. No, it's a very inviting area for sure. Now, another area related to the museum that you're very involved with and sort of groundbreaking in its own right was the Cambridge Science Festival. Um, please share what this opportunity for those who aren't familiar with it. Yeah, so Cambridge Science Festival um, first started about 17 years ago. Uh, and at the time, yeah, really groundbreaking, right? The idea that you could have a festival just about science, First of all, <laughs> though, at this point, it's really more than that, right? Like we like to get all the steam aspects in there. Um, so uh, in its current format, it's in September. It's a week long. Uh, last year, we had over 300 programs all around Cambridge. So not just this is a picture of one that was at the museum, but they're all over the place. We work really closely with the city of Cambridge, with the public library system, um, so that people uh, can can go to places that they're comfortable with or are close to them. Um, and the topics are all over the place. Usually we pick a few themes that kind of um, uh, help us, uh, yeah, highlight certain mm -hmm. kind of emerging trends that are going on at the moment. Uh, the whole week culminates in a big science carnival, which happens in this open space area right outside the museum. Um, and then this year's theme, uh, one of the big themes was around fashion and technology. Um, so I think you have a picture, maybe, yeah, um, that one, uh, where we had a whole evening at the Foundry in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, wow. Of uh, It was a whole day program of panels and discussions and workshops and hands-on and then um, culminated in this evening event. Uh, so this is an example where we had the... Uh, tough silk lab there and you could actually sort of like spray this um material on and, and the material would change in front of your eyes so it's sort of the cutting edge of materials and technology development and trying to get people that, again that might think like well, i'm a fashion person i don't have anything to do with science uh to get involved in the science and vice versa right to so be that sort of mixing ground of ideas and, and of conversation and, and in person um and every all those 300 events are free and open to the public the museum is free and open to the public that week. Um, so it's a real commitment, I think, to making uh, the museum and, and the resources. I mean, Cambridge is such a resourceful community in terms of um, STEM, what's going on, all the research that's happening, uh, to really open that up and make it feel like we're celebrating science. Um, oh, no, there's so many outreach programs from the museum. You know, in the few minutes we have left, uh, could you share a little bit more, please, about the education programs that are available through the Makerspace, the Learning Labs, or other opportunities? Yeah. So, you know, when we were, we had a Makerspace at the old museum, uh, and when we were picturing this building, we knew we wanted that 
element to continue. Cause again, like the hands-on making is such a big part of MIT and, and can help people kind of reform those connections, right. Of like, um, yeah, making something with your hands kind of changes how you see something, right? Mm -hmm. So the the Maker Hub has daily activities, like I said, they sort of rotate through a set of um, uh, explorations that usually relate to the exhibit in some way. Uh, we also recently launched um, a series of adult workshops in the evenings. So for example, right in the middle right now of a, a woodblock um wood block printing series, right? So mm -hmm. people sign up and they come three nights in a, uh, in a row, like three weeks in a row for an evening. And they really get to use our tools a little more deeply, tap more into those creativity and those sell out every time we offer them. Um, so I think there is this like, you know, um, real desire for, for that feeling like you're going somewhere, you're making something with your hands and you're learning something. We also had, a whole series of science paint nights. So mm -hmm. you've heard of paint nights, but these are like wow. using, you know, photochromic paint. So we describe the science behind it a little bit, and then we do the painting activity. Uh, and what you get is a little bit different. Um, and then of course, we also have uh, school workshops and tours uh, for middle and high school students. So we use our classroom areas for all of those. And again, they're usually tied into the exhibits, right? So for example, we have an exoplanets exploration that ties to that star shade I was talking about at the beginning. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah, it's it's been great in the new space. Uh, we've had a record breaking year last year. We had 150,000 visitors in the year. Wow. Um, and we're, we're hoping it grows from there because there are people like you that love museums, have been to the old location and didn't realize that we're, we're new and back in this new location as of two years ago. Oh, it's such a vibrant uh, institution. Uh, definitely highly recommend it. I know we'll have the website um, in the credits to find out more, but in the one or two minutes left, just very briefly, some upcoming plans, thoughts. Uh, you know, there's much more to look forward to. Yeah, I mean, if you if you do go to our website, uh, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter. It's just a monthly update of everything we have coming up. Uh, of course, we have social media accounts, especially Instagram, I would recommend. Um, and as far as what's coming up, yeah, I mean, we're actually, because we have that new director that joined us in July, we're going through strategic planning right now. We're really excited about where that's going to bring us. Um, I think we're really fully embracing this role as between art um and science and technology, right? Kind of what's that sweet spot that you don't always get to see at, at a museum um, or sort of experience or dive into as an adult. So uh, yeah, we're excited about the next chapter and uh, to see where the space can take us. Fabulous, fabulous. Well, definitely look forward to visiting uh, much sooner than it took me to make it the first time. Uh, so much to look forward to. Keelan, I just want to thank you again for taking the time to be here. Really fascinating to hear about the MIT Museum and all it has to offer. Continued success with uh, future endeavors. Thank you so much. Great to be here. I also want to thank those of you watching for joining and hope you'll be able to tune in next time.